Our bombshell report on the alleged affair between popular worship leaders Kevin Prosh and Misty Edwards sent shockwaves through the charismatic Christian community. How could two people who ushered so many into the presence of God sin in such an egregious way? But were both of them consensual partners? Or was Kevin, an admitted sexual predator, the abuser? And was Misty his victim? Welcome to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Roy's, and today we're going to discuss not just our report on Kevin and Misty, but the often misunderstood issue of adult clergy sexual abuse. This is when someone in spiritual authority intentionally uses their role, position, and power to exploit someone else sexually. Is this what happened with Kevin and Misty? Kevin was not in any formal role of authority over Misty, but he was more than 20 years older than her. And we know from published articles that Misty admired Kevin's songs and his intimate style of leading worship. Kevin also has a history of sexual predation. As I reported, in 1999, Prosh admitted to a series of adulterous relationships. Yet when you hear the way he described those relationships, they sound abusive. Prosh writes, and I quote, I committed adultery and used my gifting to manipulate the women involved. I pursued women not only sexually, but also emotionally and always for my own selfish gain and personal pleasure. The very gift God gave me to bless others with, I used to manipulate and seduce these women. We also know that Misty has spent the last 25 years in what is increasingly being exposed as a manipulative and sexually abusive environment at the International House of Prayer, or IHOP, in Kansas City. And if you haven't been following the shocking revelations concerning IHOP founder Mike Bickle, I encourage you to go to the Investigations tab at my website, julieroy, spelled R-O-Y-S, dot com. That's julieroy's.com. And there we have all of our stories on IHOP easily accessible. Well, again, there are a lot of questions surrounding what happened with Misty and Kevin, our reporting on Misty and Kevin, and this whole issue of adult clergy sexual abuse. And joining me for this discussion is a well-known expert on the topic, Dr. David Pooler. Dr. Pooler is a professor at Baylor University who's done extensive research on adult clergy sexual abuse. And I'm so looking forward to speaking further with him about this topic. But first, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this podcast, Judson University and Mark Horta Barrington. Judson University is a top-ranked Christian university providing a caring community and an excellent college experience. Plus, the school offers more than 60 majors, great leadership opportunities, and strong financial aid. Judson University is shaping lives that shape the world. For more information, just go to judsonu.edu. Also, if you're looking for a quality new or used car, I highly recommend my friends at Marquardt of Barrington. Marquardt is a Buick GMC dealership where you can expect honesty, integrity, and transparency. That's because the owners there, Dan and Kurt Marquardt, are men of character. To check them out, just go to buyacar123.com. Well, again, joining me is Dr. David Pooler, a professor at the Diana R. Garland School of Social Work at Baylor University. Dr. Pooler has more than 15 years of social work practice experience, and he has done extensive work among at-risk and abused children. But most pertinent to our discussion today is the research he's done on adult clergy sexual abuse and his desire to develop healthy church congregations. So Dr. Pooler, welcome, and I'm just so glad you could join us. I am super glad to be here. It's a real privilege and an honor, and I get to talk about something that really matters. No, it does matter. And I just so appreciate your interest in uh, abuse, but also in the way that, like, I first met you at the Restore Conference, which to me, I was just kind of blown away when I saw you had, you had signed up for it. I'm like, oh my goodness, Dr. Pooler's coming, and and he should be teaching. I should be, like, sitting under him. And yet you came just to learn and observe. And I just appreciate that. I did. I wanted to be around people that, it's almost like the folks that show up at Restore, sort of my people, if that Mm -hmm. makes sense. It's sort of a Mm -hmm. hodgepodge of people who have been injured and wounded and are still finding their way and wanting things to be better and, and, and on some level looking for church reform right? In in ways that we often aren't thinking about reform. And so I do think that this whole topic of adult clergy sexual abuse kind of sits in this 
strange place that the church just just not know what to do with. But yet there's a lot of room for hope and healing and change to occur. And that's mm. you kind know, of what I'm devoting my life to do. Mm. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate uh, after we published this article on Kevin Prosh and Misty Edwards on what uh, I had termed in the article an affair. Uh, and I know that's a very questionable word given the context of everything. But you reached out to me just with some concerns, some questions, and just in such a gracious manner. And we were able to have a Zoom call about that. And and as we're having this call, I'm thinking, this is such a profitable conversation. Mm -hmm. I want to make this public. And so I invited you to do this podcast with me. Um, but I just, I think this is going to be outstanding. And I appreciate just your your demeanor in, in coming to me about that. But let me just, instead of me trying to paraphrase you, uh, what were some of the the concerns that you had with the article and with even how, you know, things were presented? Sure. You know, when I read it, just in my study of adult clergy sexual abuse, I could immediately tell there was so much more than could be reported on there. Um, the systems, these abusive systems, and when I say abusive systems, where we have sort of a patriarchal leader, um, sort of men are elevated, and we have an issue around clericalism, where you know it's elevating the priorities and needs of of certain leaders to the exclusion of others. Anyway, but when I read the term affair, and I'm like, you know, for there to actually be an affair, there would have to be consent. There, you know, people would have to be on equal power sort of levels. And I'm like, I wonder if that's really the case here. So I had issues, you know, with the term affair, because one of the things that's really interesting and maybe interesting to, to many listeners is that there are 14 states that actually criminalize, have mm -hmm. state statutes um, where an, a, a pastoral leader, if they abuse an adult under their care, they can be charged with a crime. In some states, it's a misdemeanor, and some it's a felony. California is a current state where there's legislation happening right now that's going to be going through this session, where clergy will be added to the list of other helping professions um, around that. So I had issues with the term affair um, primarily, and I also just was a little worried, too, that um, we could end up doing some victim blaming, you know, in a sense, in this particular story blaming Misty as if she's completely complicit. Now, you know, again, I'm just sort of wondering to what extent was position, authority, the nature of the relationship, the gender, you know, are those things leveraged and exploited and sort of this long history? I know Misty's been a part of that movement for years. Yeah. In what way has she been, uh, you know, her thinking has been sort of distorted and shifted to sort of come alongside and support leaders no matter what and protect them at, at the exclusion of her her own self and her own needs. And so all of these are a part of sort of what I was like, that's what I've sort of brought to you is mm -hmm. just a concern. There's so much more complexity and nuance with this. And, you know, thankfully, I you know, your response was just amazing and led to this opportunity because in a sense, the article then gave an opportunity for a deeper, more meaningful conversation that can expand this and get more people talking about, like, what is adult clergy sexual abuse? Can pastors abuse adults and people under their care, even another minister under their care? Well, I mean, my research is with a resounding yes to all of that. And I've seen many, many cases um, where you know, it has been a positional leader under another leader who actually is abused. And I've seen the systems hold them equally accountable. I'm like, but that's not okay. And if you'll allow me, I'll share a little bit about mm -hmm. sort of what has framed my thinking around power and consent. And some mm -hmm. of it actually has to do with the secular world. The secular world is way ahead of where the church is, quite frankly, when mm -hmm. it looks at power differentials and consent in relationships Inter, you know, interpersonal relationships where there's a lot of um, connection and there's a lot at stake. For example, with a therapist or a doctor mm -hmm. or a nurse or in my profession, a social worker, right? And so we have boards that guide our behavior. And so in no situation would there ever be a case 
where as a social worker, I had a sexual connection or relationship with someone that I was working with and it would ever be called consensual. It never happened yeah. because it would be clearly labeled as misconduct and inappropriate. So not only could I lose my license as a social worker, I would then be held accountable. Generally, every state has a state statute or law to hold a helping professional accountable. Again, that's where ministry is so far behind. And I honestly think it's interesting, our separation of church and state hmm. is actually part of the problem because what happens is the church has just not been forced to keep up with evolving new ways of thinking about power and consent and relationships and boundaries and that really it's always the person with more power. It's their job and responsibility to delineate what a healthy relationship is going to be. It's their responsibility to outline the boundaries. It's their responsibility to maintain boundaries. And But yet in the church, we have done so much victim blaming. A pastoral leader um, is sexual with someone that is dependent on them, and then they mm -hmm. blame that person and says, yeah, they just did this, that, or the other. You know, a lot of the purity culture stuff, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, you know, our rape culture, quite frankly, in this society, and just, mm -hmm. oh, what was she wearing? What was she yeah. doing? She must have been the temptress, you know, those kinds of things. So that sort of sets the stage for this conversation about adult clergy sexual abuse, is some of, some of those things. And I don't disagree with you on on one thing that you just said. Um, and in fact, I think my first introduction to adult clergy sexual abuse was hearing Ann Thompson's story. And if you don't know Ann's story, she was one of the victims of Ravi Zacharias and the way that she was manipulated, the way he found out her past abuse and then used that to, you know, basically become a father figure and then to exploit that to, you know get her to do something that she would not have normally done, but it was so predatory. It was so abusive. And and I, I could see it once I heard the story. It was like, oh my goodness, of course. Um, and we've had, we've had entire podcasts we've done on this. I did one with Katie Roberts, who was, you know, in a similar type situation. And now she started an entire organization uh, helping adult um, uh, victims of adult clergy sexual abuse. And so this is something I'm familiar with. And And so if somebody asked me, do I think Misty Edwards was a victim? I would say, absolutely, 100%. Mm -hmm. I think she was a victim. What I found difficult with this story, normally the victim in the stories that I report is the source, right? It's the person who yes. comes to me with their story and says, will you please report this story for me of this person that harmed me? Here I have a situation, first time ever, honestly, where I have somebody coming to me who is saying she's not a victim. And, <laughs> and I'm, I'm having to deal with a very complex story where there were two stories in this particular case. Uh, one, which was I referred to as the other secret because you couldn't tell one story without having that story because they were intertwined. But I didn't tell that story because it involved what to me was very clearly what you just described. Mm -hmm. It was abuse. And I wasn't going to tell that story out of respect for the victim because it was clearly abuse. With Kevin and Misty, again, my opinion, it was abuse. And so now I'm, I kind of felt like it was one of those situations where you have two competing virtues and values. So on, on one hand, uh, as an advocate, your, your highest commitment is to the victim, right? You're there to protect the victim, the survivor. Right. As a journalist, your responsibility is to protect the public. It is to serve the public interest. So you have two people, Kevin Prosh and Misty Edwards. Both have very large platforms. Um, I didn't know, I'll be, I'll be honest, I didn't know Misty before I started reporting on IHOP. And then I discovered she has like a global following. Yes. Um, she has recorded seven albums with, um, I don't know if they're all with Forerunner Music. I think most of them are, which is IHOP's label. Um, and you have Kevin Prosh, who, even though he has a past, he confessed these, you know, adulterous relationships, when, which when, I mean, honestly, when you read about them, they sound like they were abused because he clearly I dare used, say, yes. yeah, he <laughs> used his position and power, you know, in these cases. I, I don't think 
I mean, I don't know whether any were congregants at his church or not, um, but certainly he has sort of a predatory pattern and, and likely was abuse uh, in these cases. But again, you have two people in positions of power, um, at least ostensibly, you know, right? Right. Um, and you have Misty, who's on the executive leadership team at HIOP, which is their highest level of leadership. You have her saying she's going to go to Israel and go serve in, in prayer houses there. Um, and I know that people are emulating her worship style because she has sort of and some a worship style that, frankly, she got from Kevin. She talks about mm -hmm. sort of this romantic worship, this intimate worship. I was in the Vineyard Movement, and so I, I – you know, parts of that, I agree with it. And parts of it, I go, we're, this is like getting a little icky, you know? And so I, I think there were just so many factors. And then having on top of it, you have someone like Brent Steno, who's a former IHOP staffer, who's saying, I was abused in this. I was harmed because I was smeared by these folks. And so I have, there were just these complex dynamics. And as a journalist, I felt, and I know a lot of people were like, well, there's a number of journalists who knew, got this story and didn't report it. Actually, from what I've heard from Brent, um, uh, Judy at the Star, for example, Casey Star, has done some excellent work on this, just hadn't figured out how to report it. Um, but, you know, from journalistically, she was like, that was a good story. And uh, I didn't hear that directly from her. But I'm just, as a journalist, Again, I felt a responsibility to the public to report this story because they were two public figures. Um, and because, and why didn't I report it as abuse? Well, because I, could, I couldn't, you know, were there some red flags there? Did Kevin have a predatory pattern? Yes, he had a predatory pattern. Did, was he a celebrity and did she look up to him? Yes, but the sure. argument could be made. She was just as big a celebrity um, as he was. Um, there was an age differential, but we can't automatically say that because there was an age differential that that was that in and of itself. Yeah, it was abuse, right? I get right. You, mm -hmm. you can't do that, and then, um, and then you have uh, just this blackmail, you know, element to the story, which clearly, I mean, when there's blackmail, that's abuse. That happened, in my understanding, five years into the relationship. So it, it definitely became coercive. But I'll be honest, I didn't know whether I could even report the blackmail aspect of this story because I have one witness telling me that she said it was blackmail. And I have one text that seems to support that where she said she wishes she could destroy all the devices. But it was pretty circumstantial. And I, sure. I mean, I'm glad I reported it because I wanted to put the clues in there to folks that they could say, could look at that and say, whoa, wait, this was not okay. Um, but at the same time, journalistically, I just felt like my hands were tied uh, in this particular case. Sure. Now, having said that, could I do, could I have done it better? Could I do it better? I'm always open to that. So, I mean, um, yeah, and, and that's why you, you have these kind of conversations afterwards to say, okay, how can we do this better? So, I mean, I, I'll just give you a chance to, you know, sure. to, to reflect on that. Yeah, the thing that, that really stands out to me that's worthy of discussion on this is mm -hmm. sort of her reporting that she's not a victim. And yeah. I and I think that that's worth taking a deeper dive into because I've met survivors at various points along their healing journey, mm -hmm. and many early on would not call themselves a victim mm -hmm. you know, on some level. They would blame themselves possibly, but not see themselves as a victim. Mm -hmm. um, and and certainly not understand that they were being abused. Like, mm -hmm. how should I say this? It's it, it would cause so much cognitive dissonance if they're not along in their healing journey or don't have a name for what's going on. Right. Because honestly, to come to grips with the fact that I had been harmed and injured to that level by someone that I had trusted my life with, my spiritual life with, sort mm -hmm. of my the, my mediator, if you will, with God, and I trusted them, and to come to a deep and abiding realization that I have been betrayed and exploited and sexually used and potentially sexually assaulted by this person—that's like too much. 
Mm. And so, but what I've noticed is that along the healing journey, as the awakening and awareness happens, they can then point back and mm. say, absolutely, I was a victim. So part, that's one of the big unknowns with Misty's journey. You know, six months from now, you know, two years from now, will the story be different? Will she then say, yes, indeed, I was a victim, and here's how I was victimized, and here's how I was injured. But most of the instincts uh, of people is to protect their abusers, to protect the church, because they've been socialized to do that. It's almost mm. like if this gets out or it's known that that we've, you know, of course, the perpetrators want to use the word affair. If we've had an affair, that would cause people to fall away from the Lord and leave. The, so they feel this enormous amount of responsibility to protect the institution, to protect the leader, to protect their abuser. And of course, to me, that's one of the big question marks at play in the story um, with with Misty. And, you know, interestingly, I had a number of conversations with Misty, some on the record, some off the record, some I can't talk about. But I will say, uh, right before I published the story, I, I called Misty and I told her, um, I know that you don't believe you're a victim. I believe you are, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and I also told her I'm, I'm not going to report the one thing that we didn't report um, and because it would to me, expose a victim to, yeah, that's their story to, to come forward with if they want to. But um, I mean, we had those those discussions and it, it was just, I, it was heartbreaking to me personally, to, to me personally, Misty's one of the most tragic figures in this, this whole story. Um, and <laughs> boy, I mean, if, if you know anything about uh, what's happened with her and I think a larger context that I, I couldn't tell in this story. Y your heart can't help but break uh, for Misty and, and this whole situation. I, you know, one thing that's that's challenging for me too, though, is, you know, as a reporter, I have to report what people tell me. Right. Right. So if somebody says they're not a victim, I have to say that person they says they're not, they're not a victim. A victim. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and and I know, too, as advocates and, it, you know, this whole advocate space is a little bit like the wild, wild west right now. I mean, we have some people that are really trained. Uh, you know, I spoke of Lori Ann Thompson. She's someone that went and got her master's degree, is very educated on um, on really advocacy and and how to come alongside pre people. But I remember at our 2022 Restore Conference, she talked about um, advocates speaking for victims and victims often say, well, speak for me because I have no voice. And she's like, excuse me, unless you're dead, you have a voice. You have a voice. And the job of advocates is to come alongside the victim and allow the victim to tell their story, not to put words in their mouth or to tell them their story for them. You know, and so it becomes very challenging when you have someone who's maybe, I mean, they're living in an alternate, I mean, really an alternate reality where they have taken blame for something they shouldn't take blame for, or they have seen this in a certain context um, where they see protecting the legacy of someone that you go, are you kidding me? Protecting the legacy of this person who's, who's an abuser? You know, why would you want to protect that legacy? But so, I mean, I, how can we, you know, as, I mean, as a reporter, I have certain rules I have to abide by. As advocates, there's a little more, you know, leeway, but, but how can we be helpful in this stage with people who, and, and right now, I'm sure Misty is representative of a lot of people who may have been victimized by a system or by a person but don't see themselves as victims. Helping people move from victim to survivor is huge. But if, if I feel like I did something wrong, I'm really not a victim. I participated in this, right? <laughs> Believe it or not, I actually still have some control. That's one of the things I've noticed as a clinician. But when I say I've actually been victimized, that means I literally could have done nothing to stop it. It's like mm. it literally happened. I am powerless. Mm. That doesn't mean their power is going forward, but just the acknowledgement of the nature of the wounding and the injury was this was totally done to me by someone else. And I think that's really, really hard for people, for Misty and or lots of other people in that sort of space, right? And I think part of it is having conversations like this, 
mm-hmm. being able to have an adequate definition of adult clergy sexual abuse to actually say, hey, it's when a leader uses their power position, their authority um, to to basically gain access, access sexually to someone under their care or that they're working with or supporting in some way. Mm-hmm. That person's dependent on them in some way, and they've used that dependence as a way to be sexual with them. That's adult clergy sexual abuse. And, you know, interestingly, if, if someone's 16 or 20, there's nothing magical that happens when someone is 18. The same tactic someone uses to groom and exploit a 15-year-old is the same that they would use to groom and exploit and be sexual with someone who's 25. It's the same dynamics. And so uncovering those dynamics, talking about how people are groomed, because that's the thing. Abusive leaders use the the language, the culture, Bible verses, and even sort of their authority, their pastoral authority, you know, God is in this, or the Holy Spirit has told me. They use all that language to gain sexual access to somebody. And then when you look at that, it's just grotesque, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's predatory on the deepest level. So being able just to honestly have the conversation for the church to say, this is indeed happening in our midst, mm. and we have very little um, in place to detect abusive people. We have no, very, almost nothing set up within our religious structures where people can go to report it or a mm-hmm. system that's going to listen to it or believe the person. You know, in my research, one of the things that's most damaging actually to survivors is the church response. If that makes mm-hmm. sense, it's not just mm-hmm. the nature of the injury itself, but it's the way the institution fails to respond adequately by believing them and supporting them and validating them and helping them get help and then holding the abusive leader accountable or removing them um, from ministry or out of the way so they can't harm anybody else. They We just tend to continue to elevate the abusive person and shove the victim right out the door, right? Mm. And and that's that's sort of the playbook of mm-hmm. of the evangelical world. But I'll be honest, it's it's beyond the evangelical world. I mean, there's a case I'm involved with right now where I'm going to be sort of an expert witness, if you will. And it's a much more progressive denomination, but the narrative is the same. Oh, it was mm. consensual, mm. and it clearly was not. We really have a a problem. And I'll give you just a quick statistic. This is really old, but Diana Garland's research. Going back to a study in 2009, she actually looked at, you know, what percentage of women who regularly attend church had an unwanted sexual advance from their church leader. Um, And the unwanted sexual advance was sort of framed Mm -hmm. in such a way that it would be clearly wrong if someone found out they would really have concerns Mm -hmm. about what had happened. But if you, you sort of extrapolate this out to the average size church and sort of the gender makeup of your average size church, so if you take an average size church of 400, there would be seven women in every church of 400 in the United States where this wow. has happened. So again, wow. it's not, it's about 3%. So it's not a huge amount, right? Mm-hmm. But it's also something that we have to take very, very seriously. It is indeed happening. And I would say, you know, every church has someone who's experienced some version of sexual exploitation or harassment by a church leader. Like, mm. I mean, that we we could have every year, you know, we, we do domestic violence months and things, but we ought to celebrate and honor those people who've been injured by clergy and say, you are among us. You mm. are here. We care mm. about you. We care about your experiences. And we know you've been injured within the church mm. and we're doing something about it, right? Instead of just yeah. ignoring the problem. Well, in this environment that you're describing, where, I mean, obviously we have predators, obviously, well, I'll say allegedly, but it's been, certainly we have so many victims right now or alleged victims that have come forth and said, you know, Mike Bickle uh, abused me, started when I was 14 or 15 or 19, uh, you know, depending on the particular story. But but this seems like a man who was a serial predator mm-hmm. uh, and and preyed on the women that were under him and had this persona of being so pure and so, you know, God spoke directly to him. (laughs) The angel Gabriel showed up. I mean, how could you possibly question this man of God? And then you have this whole history, this prophetic history that seems like it was almost put on the level of scripture. Like, you can't question this history. Like, this is what's happened. 
And it was really, I mean, so grandiose. I'm reading this and I'm going, whoa, like, why didn't red flags go up? Yet I heard from somebody recently who was like, yeah, it probably would have, but he was accepted in mainstream evangelicalism, which to me is a whole other discussion. Like, wh why did nobody see that this was a problem? Um, I mean, these are really, really grandiose things that he is claiming and stating very early on um, and selling to impressionable young, you know, young adults, men and women who are, who are a part of this. But let's talk about, you know, specifically at some place like IHOP where, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to say that abuse happens more at charismatic uh, churches than non-charismatic. I've seen plenty at non-charismatic, right. but I have to say when you think that your leader is is like got a direct line with God and you have this uh, Moses model of leading, which is really an Old Testament, I won't get into all of that, but I mean this idea that God speaks to your your pastor like he spoke to Moses and, and now he's the prophet and the word for you or he's the apostle and the, the word for you. Um, and again, I see in the New Testament a totally different thing where the gifts are available to everyone. It's There isn't like one person who has a direct line to God. We all have a direct line to God in that sense. Um, but speak to this particular mm -hmm. system, you know, what, again, we're, we're outsiders, although you were in the Church of God, which is, that mm -hmm. was, you know, started with Assemblies of God, right? I mean, the two were very connected. Yeah, sister kind denominations, of, are kind yeah. of same origins, or, yeah, around the turn of the last century, right? Okay. Yeah, the, and I was in Vineyard, so I mean, I've, I have, uh, I, there's a lot that I absolutely love about charismatic denominations, and I love about the charismatic movement, and I'm not a cessationist, but at the same time, I do think there are some things that are, that are particular to these systems that can lend themselves to this kind of clergy sexual abuse. Absolutely. Yeah. Where I literally go back to is that the clericalism again, and I think it can be heightened in spaces like this where you have a central charismatic leader whose authority is almost unquestioned because what ends up happening is there's a high level of dependence on everyone upon what they say and what they do, what they say is okay, what they say is not okay. And it's a diminishing of power among everyone else around mm. their sense of personal agency, their ability to think critically, ask questions, dissent, push back, right? So none of that is tolerated. So in a system like that, if that leader crosses the line and wants to be sexual and says, it's God's will, no one's going to question, right? I mean, the system is set up to sort of make perfect victims. And mm. it's not just the IHOP system. There's plenty of others. But when we're talking about that, I mean, it literally sets people up to be exploited and victimized. I mean, I don't mean to oversimplify it, but that's it in a nutshell right there. And so one of the things I suggest in my research is a much deeper level of power sharing between leadership and laity or congregants, right? A much... Mm more robust way of holding people accountable. Right. The other, the, the one thing I have, I've struggled with is, so how do congregants benefit from clericalism? Well, they don't have to do as much work. They don't have to do as mm. much critical thinking. They don't have to be at the table being my brother's keeper, really. Mm. They mm. get to sort of offload all of that responsibility onto the leader. And the mm. fact is, that's not a great system. We need a much better system where people are empowered in congregations to really all be concerned about abuse, all be concerned about exploitation, and to flip it to the other side to be concerned about flourishing mm -hmm. and well-being. And how do we have a really healthy congregation, right? Mm -hmm. Then if mm -hmm. everyone's really not at the table talking about that, and one leader's trying to tell you what a healthy thing is— you're probably not. It's probably going way off into the ditch, which is what we've actually seen had been happening at IHOP for years. It just, you know, there were people being injured and torn up and ground up under the machinery of this institution, mm -hmm. right? You yeah. know, in a sense, people waylaid and victimized for years, and it's, it just finally came to light mm -hmm. because any dissent, anyone speaking up or questioning or trying to bring it to light would have immediately been pushed out of the system. The yeah. system wouldn't tolerate that. And I'm I'm trying to figure out how 
how though, like when you're in a system like that, I mean, you read the scripture, it's pretty clear. I mean, you have someone like Mike Bickle, married, clearly shouldn't be engaging in outside sexual activity, you know? Um, and yet, if you're the the recipient of his sexual advances, I mean, how do you how do you put that dissonance together when you and 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 I know people are pushing back and saying, well, well, okay, how did they not know that this was was wrong or why? You know, why when you're in a system like that, how are I mean, what what happens just psychologically? To put these two, you know, seemingly contradictory things together, how do you do that? Yeah. So honestly, your your question kind of gets at the grooming process. And what I've noticed with these predatory folks is they start creating a culture where more physical touch is okay. Um, and most of the predators will test the people out. They'll do a prolonged hug or other things. And they do this over months and months and months. And eventually, I, mean, I can't tell you how many times this happened. It'd be so interesting to find out if how many mm -hmm. folks that I have this happened to. They'll be like, can I kiss your hand? You know, and then can I kiss your neck? And then eventually it's a kiss on the lips. So it's not just a, you know, it's the, the adage of the frog boiling in the water. You don't just mm -hmm. drop them in the boiling water, it jumps out or whatever. You right. slowly turn it up. These predatory folks have mastered grooming and they'll slowly blur and break boundaries over months and sometimes even years till they finally have the person and have full access to them. And they'll use whatever playbook they need, including the things I just talked about, but again, adding in the scripture and those things. So by the time the person is, if you will, actually being sexual with the leader, they've, they're no longer trusting their intuition. So anytime mm -hmm. someone's intuition said something's wrong, Right. That's the other thing about those systems is that intuition is sort of tossed out. Like your gut reaction that something is wrong is mm -hmm. sort of squashed over and over and over and over to the point it doesn't work anymore. So mm -hmm. you don't trust yourself at all. You've been socialized to trust the leader and mm -hmm. their perspective. So in a sense, that's how that dissonance occurs is slowly broken down over time. So by the time sexual activity is actually happening, even though the person, so honestly, the victim is actually, I've, I've heard this so many times, they they literally feel insane. They mm -hmm. feel completely insane, like, this can't be okay, but yet I'm being told it's okay. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with me? I mean, it is an, an internal sort of soul injury of dissonance that's ripping them apart. But yet they're they've been taught to conform, to be to stay in church and to keep trusting the leader no matter what, because of course they know what they're doing. God has called them and God is in charge of this. You know, all these things mm -hmm. that get used to injure people. And this is the stuff we've got to really be talking about. In fact, I'm actually have a doctoral student right now. We're working on a paper right now to identify the grooming tactics. So what we're mm -hmm. hope to do is sort of spit in the soup of the playbook of predators right? Quite mm. frankly, so that their playbook doesn't work anymore. I mean, maybe mm. they'll come up with new tactics, but at least the ones that have been regularly used and in, in the survivors I've interviewed, right? That, th those, that won't be accessible anymore. We'll know how they do it. And so that when someone sees a leader doing something or saying something, they can trust their intuition that this information is now actually out for the public to consume and use to inform them to, to be in a sense, a better citizen or a better participant or a better congregant. Talk about this in the secular world, sort of the non-protecting bystander. We have mm. so much of that going on right now in the church where it's like, I see something, I wonder, is, is that okay? Or when the pastor mm. did that, but we're just taught to sort of where we don't, we don't protect, we don't intervene, we just stay back. Mm -hmm. Because that behavior of getting in and sort of getting it messy. We don't mm -hmm. like that. But I honestly think that that kind of messiness and questioning, critical thinking is a part of what actually would make our churches way healthier. The problem is you're not allowed to question. Like if you say there is a problem, then you are the problem. I've interviewed so many people from IHOP who said, yeah, I would see women go into Mike's mm -hmm. office and spend an inordinate amount of time. And like, we didn't have access to Mike like that. But why did these women who weren't even necessarily very high up in the organization, you know, were going into his office and spending all this time? 
And why are there padlocks on the inside of the office? I mean, some of these things that are just bizarre, but he had he had ways of dealing with that. And I'm sure with his victims, you know, and I've heard this from victims who thought they were in love, you know, oh, with absolutely. their abuser, think they're in love with their abuser. And then also think, you know, like with Ravi, it was like, you, you can't expose me. I need this because I'm under so much pressure and, you know, I'm just human. And, uh, you know, if I don't have this kind of support from you, then I just can't function and you're critical to my functioning. And if you say anything, then, oh, do you, do you want to bring down the whole, you know, apologetics movement or in this case, the whole prayer movement? You want that to be on you that you've just brought that all down? I mean, even now, people are protecting the prayer movement. They're, they're protecting Mike's legacy. They're protecting something that has been shown to be fraudulent. Not that the whole prayer movement is fraudulent, but certainly whatever requires Mike Bickle as its foundation is not legitimate. What does a, a bystander do, though? And and these are these are my sources that I talk to almost every day, right? And 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 Brent in this in this story was a bystander, right? He's a bystander, but he wasn't just a bystander. You know, if if you believe his story, and I obviously, obviously did believe his story, Misty divulged a lot of these things to him, um, but then also confines him to secrecy. Like all of a sudden now, I remember when I was in youth ministry when people would be like, I'm going to tell you something, but I don't want you to tell anybody else. And I'd be like, no, 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 time out, time out. Uh, you know what? If there's certain things, if you tell me, I, I'm responsible to tell somebody else. I'm trusting that you're telling me because you trust me, and I will try to be trustworthy. But that trustworthiness may mean that I have to tell somebody about what you're going to tell me. So let me just put that out there, ground rules, before you tell me anything further. So here's Brent in this situation, though. Now he's stuck with this secret. And what does he do? Like, it's ripping him up. It's destroying him. What does he do and what do bystanders do or witnesses do in a situation where they see abuse? And if they come forward, as in this case, and this is a whole other dynamic too, which may be a follow-up question to this, is when the, the victim becomes part of the abusive system and begins harming other people. But what do you do as a, as a bystander in that situation? The, yeah, the, the complications are sort of built into all of this. There's not a path. There's not the one thing that you're supposed to do. But I do think staying silent is not okay and doing nothing is not okay. We have to do something. And I do think many people who bring up or confront a system where there's a lot of power held in one person or bring up something that's of a major concern they're going to get injured by that system because that system is protecting itself. Yeah. And it's protecting the power and the control that it has. And part of it is when someone's bringing up something or pointing out something that's wrong or where there's injury, it's a threat to the system. If the system is that unhealthy, right? And it mm -hmm. is abusive. It's like, we don't want to get found out, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, so there, there's no simple answer other than, yeah, I think people are going to have to take the risk and put their own neck out for someone else. That, again, so anytime you stand up for someone who's being injured, the likelihood of you being injured too is very high. Mm. It's and courage. It, it is. And so often they do what they're told to do in the church, which is, go to your leaders within your organization. And sadly, those leaders within the organization, they've been groomed to protect. Yes. And so they are going to, as you say, they're going to harm you. And so, you know, it's people often say, well, who made you judge and jury, you know, as, as journalists, where we report on a, a lot of these stories. For one, I'm not judge and jury. I report the facts. You're the judge and jury. You are. Yeah. Yeah. You know, people make you, sense of what you're reporting. Yeah. That's right. I report the facts. You make sense of, of it. Mm -hmm. And I wish we didn't have to exist. I wish the church had had some sort of structures in place to police itself. And it does in some denominations. They don't seem to be working very well, these structures that we have in place. I hope at some point we at least, I love that there's 14 states where adult clergy sexual abuse is a crime, as mm -hmm. it should be. I, I hope that more states are like this. But it seems to me at the very least, 
there should be some sort of professional, you know, just like when you're a doctor or a therapist or whatever, there are professional standards. I know as a journalist, there are professional standards. You, you can go and read them, you know, where the Society of Professional Journalists have put it out. This, this is what we adhere to. This is what we do. And and we we have to adhere to them. And if you don't, then, you know, you can be disqualified. Do we need to get some system in place for the licensing pastors? I mean, wouldn't that be great? The fact yeah. is, I think we're, there is no way probably even in my lifetime that our society, we can get there. Um, mm -hmm. because, because, I mean, because currently what we have are different denominations that have mm -hmm. varying ways of, here's the education that you, you know, some, some denominations might require having a master of divinity for ordination. Some mm -hmm. might require nothing. You could have a yeah. high school diploma or not even, and go through a process. And I mean, you can get a ministerial ordination certificate online for free. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that's sort of the, it is the absolute wild west, a completely unregulated space, even though I agree sort of ideally in an ideal world, absolutely we should. But, but again, that's part, I mean, the, the very nature of the question is why we have such a huge problem in our religious institutions right now is because of that mm -hmm. lack of accountability. I mean, right? And so mm -hmm. many people with power surround themselves by yes men, yes women, yes people, right? Mm -hmm. Who aren't going to hold them accountable, who are just a part of that system of control and power and money. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to be cynical, um, too cynical, but I also want to be incredibly realistic that there are way too many leaders, if you will, mm -hmm. doing what they do because it's unregulated. They're mm -hmm. free to do whatever they want to do. They have an enormous amount of power and influence and money, yeah. and they're going to keep doing it because it benefits them in an incredible way. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think there's far too many pastors out there that that don't understand this and that don't understand this dynamic. And so they're restoring these, you know, abusive pastors who, again, it's not just a sin problem. I mean, there's something deep deeply, deeply wrong when someone is a is a predator like this and a serial predator. You don't just confess it and then go back to another church. And but Stephen Strang, uh, who's the, you know, the CEO of Charisma uh, Media, Charisma Magazine, uh, he went on before. I mean, Mike has given like a half apology that it really isn't an apology. I mean, it, he hasn't even come close to owning this and repenting from this. And Stephen Strang saying, Oh, isn't it a noble thing to restore people? I've always thought that was a noble thing. And so we just keep restoring these pastors. Talk about the mm -hmm. the the pastor as a predator. Should someone who's abused somebody in this way ever be restored to a position of trust? In my opinion, after having done so much research on this, almost never. Like that would be the exception rather than the rule. If anyone could ever return to ministry and influence people that way they had, you know, part of your question gets at something that I think we weaponize, which is forgiveness. We are actually using mm. and weaponizing forgiveness as a shortcut. And actually then what we do is we put the burden on the person who's been injured. You just need to forgive. And once you've forgiven, then we can restore. It's almost like forgive, forgive, forgive. And once we hear you're okay again, and that every, you know, we'll, we'll put them back in ministry. We, we will, you know, so, so the, the, the burden is in the wrong place. The mm -hmm. burden should be on the person who's done the injuring and, and go through a, an incredibly rigorous, re even if they're not restored in any particular way, they need to make the, make right the wrong they've done. Mm -hmm. They literally need to take years to do the work, to figure out what happened, why they did it, the exact nature of the injuries that they've caused, mm -hmm. and figuring out ways to actually help heal those, mm -hmm. right? That's where the burden should be. So if someone were ever to be restored, it should be the exception. And to me, it would be years in the making. But typically what we do, we remove someone from ministry, we send them off somewhere. And it's not even really therapy. It's some discipleship program somewhere that people go through for four months and say they're restored and we bring them back. That is completely inadequate. So I'm mm. with you that 
Yeah. I mean, in most of my writing, I'm just like, yeah, whenever this happens, it should preclude them ever having a job in ministry again. Because for me as a social worker, it would. If I were sexual with a client, I'd lose my license and I wouldn't be able to work in my chosen profession. Why why do ministers who have all this power and authority and esteem Mm. and represent God get to just jump right back in? It's like we've we've got it upside down right now. We do. And and I think what people don't realize is that fundamentally there is deception at the core of this. So this is someone who is skilled at deceiving people. So how on earth do you know that this person is repentant? How on earth do you know if this person won't reoffend? They're a master manipulator and deceiver. I mean, you just don't put people like that back in positions where they're over people and they have they have authority and, and a means of manipulating people. I mean, you just cannot do that. I mean, I look at certain pastors who have fallen and I'm like, there, there are not enough years left in this, this person's life to restore the trust they've betrayed. There, there's just not. The only way you know if someone's changed is over time, a long time in a community. And we're, we're sadly in, in a situation in evangelicalism where the pastor's removed from community, especially in these mega churches, especially in these big movements. They're re- removed from accountability. People don't know them. And again, just ripe for this type of abuse. So, so glad we're talking about it. And I don't want to not touch on on something that I, I mentioned earlier, but we didn't really dig into it. Talk about the the victim who then becomes a victimizer, who becomes part of the system. I, I don't know how common that is. I will say in my reporting, it hasn't been all that common. But in this particular case, there's at least some people saying there was Misty participating in some harm. I don't think she saw it as that. Sure. Um, but again, talk about that dynamic sure. and how, how that happens and, and how to deal with it. Right. So to universalize this on some level, right? We've all been injured and we've all injured others on some level. So we mm-hmm. can just sort of state that that's sort of a fact about being human. But I would just say, in my experience, most victims of adult clergy sexual abuse, they themselves do not go on to injure and harm others. However, Mm -hmm. I think some of the exceptions to that are when that person who potentially is being abused and injured is at the core and has power and has influence, and there's something at stake in both the way that they're protecting the system and some of even protecting their own interests, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In some way, whether that's financial, emotional, psychological, whatever that is. And I think when we're backed into a corner, we're likely to lash out and injure others. So it it absolutely can happen. But, you know, I guess that's the thing is like, where do you go back and tracing back, you know, you know, I say hurt people, hurt people, right? I mean, mm-hmm. on some level, that that that's exactly right. But I think what's important is maybe maybe what is important in all this is sort of teasing out some of these dynamics that yes, someone may have been a victim and then they have injured someone else in a certain way. They don't get off the hook for that, mm-hmm. right? They mm-hmm. need to make that right, acknowledge that, and own that. In any given day, any of us can injure or heal. But in case, you know, I think part of what we have to just say is that all injuries are not the same, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when you've got a predatory person deeply injuring someone who's going to have major pain for the rest of their life, right? Mm -hmm. I'll just add a statistic. I've just got a paper that's under review right now. Um, But 39% of the uh, survivors of adult clergy sexual abuse that participated in my research, 39% have PTSD. The injuries mm-hmm. are deep, abiding, and profound. This mm-hmm. isn't just a little fly-by-night, oh, this is no big deal. I mean, the data I'm looking at are saying this is a huge deal. Mm-hmm. It's causing post-traumatic stress disorder, a yeah. mental health diagnosis that has profound impact on how we function and think and navigate relationships. Mm-hmm. It's a big deal. 
I and it's not just adult clergy sexual abuse. It, I mean, the amount of spiritual abuse and what that does to people. I will never forget. And this was very early on in my reporting, when I was reporting on Harvest Bible Chapel and James McDonald and the, the harm he was causing people. And there was a couple that came over. It was actually the former chairman of the board of elders at Harvest and his wife. And sh they had been out of the church for ten years. They came over. And I'll never forget, his wife was literally shaking. And she's like, I've been out of it 10 years. I think she had never seen a counselor to get this diagnosis, but she's like, I am sure I have PTSD. Mm -hmm. She's like, to this day. And she was shaking, telling these stories, 10 years out of it. I remember somebody else I talked to said, his counselor asked him at one point, how often do you think about James McDonald? And he's like, well, it's at least seven times a week because he knew daily he still thought of the abuse that he had received it. And again, no sexual abuse in this, just bullying and nasty spiritual abuse. And, and it, it, it is just such a scourge in, in our, in our churches right now and something we don't understand. And so, you know, I, I appreciate so much you reaching out. I, I, um, boy, this is one story I have, I've just agonized over before I published. I, I'm, I continue to, <laughs> to agonize afterwards, you know, could we have framed something differently? But um, I just think all of us, we need to be asking these questions, need to be doing better, you know, at, at understanding it in the church and having more of these discussions. And so I'm very grateful for that. Um, I, do you have, is there anything that I haven't brought up that, you know, as you're looking at this particular situation that you feel needs to be highlighted or, or that we just haven't explored yet? Yeah, I think there's there there's something that you touched on earlier, and I you know I would kind of circle back to it, and it was and it's just this one because I think it's important, and maybe this is an interesting place for this to end, mm -hmm. um, but around maybe the the person who's been injured who thinks they're in love with their abuser. Mm -hmm. Um, I think so. You can is that the Stockholm syndrome? Well, it, it can be, but I think on, on its on its deepest, yes, yes, that's mm -hmm. part of it. At its deepest level is that this person has met a need for for that for the survivor. In other words, mm -hmm. a need a, a, for belonging, affirmation, mm -hmm. feeling important, feeling mm -hmm. valued, feeling essential. You know, having a sense of purpose, and these predators actually exploit all of those very human normal needs that could be met in very healthy ways as far as being a part of a congregation, right? Mm -hmm. But are met in a way that, of course, you know, how I describe that grooming process and it sort of takes on a life of its own, but there's this sense of this person loves me, right? And, and of course, in that, I'm going to protect the person who I think loves me and I mm. love them, right? And so um, sort of breaking that trauma bond almost around that is a huge part of recovery for people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I guess if anything, I would just want to validate it's a, it's a messy and complex journey for people. And what we've got to do better in the church is see it for the abuse that it is and quickly come as, alongside people who've been injured in our midst and include them and embrace them and let them remain in our congregation. Because right now the status quo is to push them out and exclude them and blame them and ask what they did wrong. Really, the reason we do that is all our collective cognitive dissonance around the fact that we currently, in 2024, have predatory leaders in our midst all over the place, injuring people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We would rather believe that the church is wonderful, our churches are healthy, our churches are safe, our leaders are amazing, aren't they wonderful people? But it it sort of upsets our little utopia that we, we've created for ourselves. And so I guess that that's sort of where I would end is that it getting through this is a re require a depth of critical thinking, a depth of courage, a depth of sort of awakening and self-awareness, a reckoning with ourselves in a way that the church just isn't used to. But I think 
if the church can move in that direction, the church would be far more appealing to others. Of like, look, there's a place that's wrestling with its own self, with its own questions and its own failures and really authentic ways that are like really dealing with the hurts that have been caused and holding people accountable. Because right now, I mean, you know, I can't imagine people looking at some of the crises that are facing the church and being attracted to it at all. I mean, if anything, it's got to be nauseating and repulsive. Like, I don't want anything to do with that. So that's sort of my invitation, my call, sort of going back to just how messy this is. It's like, you know, being a Christian isn't for, it's not easy. It's not for people who want an easy way or an easy path. In fact, it calls us to the depths of injuries and hurt. Like it's, yeah, even my own theology has changed as a result of looking at all of this, right? Mm -hmm. My theology is no longer sort of super positive and super wonderful and, you know, just sort of isn't, isn't God great and isn't being a Christian super fun? No, it's a lot of hard work. It's grief. It's it's soul effort expended in ways I never imagined. Mm. But but I honestly think, oh, I'll end with this. I think the survivors of this kind of trauma and injuries in our church actually are some of our future church leaders. They mm. know best what a healthy church would look like. Mm. They know best what to avoid in a leader. Who, get, who would injure people, they know best what it's like to actually heal from some of the deepest wounds that you could experience, right? Yeah. So I don't know. that I, I have a lot of hope for where we are, but it's going to include the voices of people who've been deeply injured in our spaces of adult clergy sexual abuse, you know, spiritual abuse, some of the things that you cover and talk about. It's those very people who are making their way through this that that can lead us and bring us new light. Mm, I agree with that 100%. I think Phil Monroe, in the the message that he gave to Restore in 2022, said something along those lines. Mm. And I, the sweetness when you are around survivors who, I mean, these are people whose faith has been through the fire. And some of them Absolutely. are clinging to just like barely clinging on to faith. But some of them also, I mean, if you come through this and and you even have a mustard seed left, that's yeah. commendable. That's all I can say. And so I think these these folks are are our teachers. They will be our teachers. And can I just say, I mean, with this particular story, I, I do I do pray for Misty. I Absolutely. really do. And um, I I really truly truly hope that she comes to a place of being able to tell her story truthfully to herself. Um, and I think she will find. There is a great deal of love and support uh, for her and for others who have been through through similar mm -hmm. things. So thank you, David. I so appreciate uh, you joining me. I learned a ton, uh, as always. Um, just really wonderful. So thank you. Thank you, Julie. I so appreciate being here. What, an, what a privilege. And thanks so much for listening to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Roy's. And just a quick reminder, all of our content at The Roy's Report is available free of charge. We don't erect paywalls. We don't make you pay for our conference talks. Everything is free and available to the public. However, that doesn't mean that it doesn't cost us money to produce it. It does. And if you want to know how we spend our money, our financial reports are available on our donate page. All that to say, we rely on your donations to do what we do. So if you believe in our mission of reporting the truth and restoring the church, would you please help us out this month? To do so, just go to julieroys, spelled R-O-Y-S, dot com slash donate. That's julieroys dot com slash donate. Also, just a quick reminder to subscribe to The Roy's Report on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. That way, you won't miss any of these episodes. And while you're at it, I'd really appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word about the podcast by leaving a review. And then, please share the podcast on social media so more people can hear about this great content. Again, thanks so much for joining me today. Hope you were blessed and encouraged.